What an incredible day. Unbelievable. Euro 2020 did not disappoint on this Monday as France, France bows out of the tournament courtesy of a heroic Swiss performance and Spain and Croatia also give us a Thrilling, thrilling game. I almost even hiccuped on my own words because it was so exciting. Spain go through as well. So it's Spain against Switzerland in the quarterfinals. We have this with Jonathan Johnson to discuss as well as Tuesday's action, including England against Germany and, of course, Sweden against Ukraine. Kego Lasso begins right now. And breathe, everybody. Exhale. What a day. Euro 2020. Incredible. 14 goals from two matches. Unbelievable. Jonathan Johnson in the house. JJ, how are you, my friend? Uh, I mean, kind of relieved and drained in a way uh, after all of that. You know, it's a major roller coaster, but not, not even just... Uh, France, Switzerland, you know, but uh, Spain, Croatia before as well, you know, two matches going to extra time, so many goals, so many dramatic moments. <laughs> Incredible that we managed to pack that in to just two games. I got to be honest, it's one of the greatest days of football ever. I uh, just, uh, I'm unbelievable. As you mentioned, two amazing games, so much entertainment, so many goals. We're going to get uh, straight into it, of course, but just an unbelievable plethora of uh, entertainment in Euro 2020 really delivered today and with some major, major headlines. And we begin, of course, Jonathan Johnson, France. My tip to win it, I know you as well, obviously. I mean, actually, was it? Yeah, you had it, right? You Them in Portugal. Anyway, we're going to talk yeah. about it in a second. Regardless, <laughs> it was a, 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 a worthy nominee because... I'm, I'm we, sensing a theme in this already. Don't trust what either of us call in yeah. his predictions. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Don't ever trust anything what we say. But no, listen, like who saw this coming? Honestly, unbelievable. Uh, France lose to penalties. Kylian Mbappé misses, or more importantly, I guess, uh, Sommer really saves it. And meaning that a uh, heroic Swiss performance and they go through, they'll be facing Spain in the quarterfinal. That's Friday noon Eastern. Your initial reaction from the game? I mean, obviously, uh, from a French point of view, it's hugely disappointing, but you have to give credit to Switzerland. I mean, to pull off that fight back, uh, you know, it's just incredible. But there's just so much to unpack from that match. I mean, honestly, it, it kind of felt like there were just different acts in the whole game. You know, you had the the complete waste of a first half by France, uh, you know, where they were playing with this ridiculous three-man defense that they've rarely ever tried. Uh, you know, Clément Langlais was you know, so out of his depth, it was unreal. Switzerland looked in full control at that point. Ricardo Rodriguez steps up to take the penalty. Could be 2-0. 90 seconds later, France 2-1 up through two Karim Benzema goals. You know, it's just, and then you've got France going 3-1 up with Pogba with his sensational strike. And then Switzerland somehow coming back into it. I mean, in terms of equalizing goals, Gavranovic's composure for that equalizer is just incredible. Uh, you know, and then I think it would have been you know, we were asking a lot for them to keep going uh, after the end of 90 minutes into extra time. And I think it was just, you know, a matter of seeing it out uh, and going going to penalties. And it's obviously it's it's heartbreaking. It's never nice to see any team, uh, you know, lose uh, on penalties. Obviously, you know, major ecstasy for, for, for the Swiss fans tonight to do it on spot kicks. Uh, you know, they don't have a great record against France that they now have this, uh, you know, which they can celebrate and, and, and rightly will do because, you know, they deserved it for the character that they showed. And I also think that France, you know, would have really gotten away with it if they'd gone through considering the, the tactical mishap or misfire from, from Deschamps at the beginning of the match. Uh, you know, and some of the the sloppy play that we've seen from the really throughout the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Some very good points. You 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 reviewed that game beautifully. I, I will just add, um, Karim Benzema had a incredible Hollywood moment where he walks up to Hugo Lloris, tells him something before the penalty. He saves it. Then <laughs> in 90 seconds, he scores a brace. One of them, that touch, that Burkamp esque touch, unbelievable. And then, as you mentioned, Switzerland somehow. Honestly, in a way, I don't know where equalized, not I don't know where, I don't want to be that disrespectful, but you know what I mean? You just thought that the narrative was just going to be, okay, this is France. They're going through unbelievable and they didn't. And hats off to Switzerland. They kept fighting in extra time. And Sommer is a very good goalkeeper. He, especially in uh, set piece situations and penalty takes and 
you know, I don't want to completely finger point here to Kylian Mbappé. I don't think it's been his best tournament, but it is not on. It's kind of unfair to just have everything against them. To your point, I think there's been a lot of moments in this uh, France performance throughout the tournament where you just you never saw a complete package. And I think today was a was a good example of that. You saw obviously just how good they are, but today, I mean, the Swiss just had a perfect plan, and and, and, and you know. In extra time, when they had the ball, they really were just like, let's just slow the tempo down and let's just gamble and let's just see what happens in penalty shootouts. We don't have to go for it right here. And, and they put their trust in their goalkeeper and their players are unbelievable. Unbelievable victory. Look, look, look I, don't, I don't disagree with you about Kylian Mbappe, but I do think that at some point he's going to have to shoulder a bit of blame for the behavior that's gone on this tournament. Yeah. You know, nobody's doubting that he's a phenomenal player. You know, that's not going to change. And this is probably a bit of a David Beckham-esque moment for, for him, you know, back in the 1998 World Cup when he got sent off against Argentina, was vilified for a while and sort of had to win the nation's trust back. But Mbappe's behavior via this tournament, there was no need for it. And, you know, I feel like it was one of the major destabilizing factors in the French camp. Uh, you know, many people expected it to be, uh, you know, coming from the, the the reintegration of Karim Benzema, you know, but really there's, there's barely been any tension at all, you know, aside from the very beginning when Giroud's comments were, uh, you know, sort of misconstrued. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of blown up with the whole Mbappe element. And, and since then, you know, instead of trying to put it into its place and just concentrate on the tournament, you know, Mbappe, you know, almost sort of reveled in it, you know, being in the spotlight in the wrong way, uh, you know, and he's completely put himself in the shade in the tournament. So, you know, I think now that he's got a lot of reflecting to do over the summer, you know, he's been, you know, leading the media on for months and months with talk about his future. You know, what's he going to do? Is he going to is he going to stay with PSG and sign a contract extension? Is he going to try and, you know, move on somewhere else? There's no obvious place for him to go at the moment. No one's going to pay the money that PSG wants, uh, you know, and PSG don't want to let a player of his talent go. That talent's not going to disappear overnight because he missed a penalty in this game. Sure, it's going to hurt for a while, but, you know, he will get over it and he's young enough to, to, to rebuild, uh, you know, his international reputation after this. It's, uh, you know, it, it's silly to suggest that, uh, you know, he's going to be labeled, you know, a fraud like I've seen being thrown around on, on Twitter in the media aftermath of the game. That's not going to happen, but... You know, I think serious questions do need to be asked because the thing that I saw in the game against Switzerland that worried me more than anything, worried me more than the poor defense, was the number of players questioning Didier Deschamps on the pitch about the tactics France were playing. You know, because if that trust, if that understanding has been broken, then France are going to have to make a major change. And I think it will be, you know, wise for them to, to dispense with Deschamps if uh, you know, the players no longer are buying into that system because the whole reason that France were able to win the World Cup under Deschamps was the fact that they were all, all pulling in the same direction. And it feels like with this tournament, that's not been the case. And Mbappe, unfortunately, has been one of the most guilty of that. No, yeah, some very, very good points, my friend. And listen, um, you know, when Le Keep reported as well that, you know, the squad was asking Didier Deschamps to revert to this 3-4-3 three, three, and, you know, the fact that you're a manager and you have to, like, kind of, like, appease that in some way. We got Fabrizio Romano saying how, you know, now the French Federation is going to make some key decisions now with Deschamps and uh, Zinedine Zidane, who doesn't have a job right now, who might be intrigued by this. I know that it's definitely Florentino Perez did say that it's one of Zidane's uh, wishes at some point to manage it. So would, is this the end of Didier Deschamps, do you think? I don't think necessarily it's the end of Didier Deschamps right now, uh, you know, but I do think that there will be a period of reflection. And the one thing that I would say in, in Deschamps' favor is if he feels like the players have undermined him, uh, you know, and that they're not following his instructions through anymore, he feels that there's been, uh, you know, sort of a, a, another explosion of ego within the camp, which he's tried so hard to stamp out over the years, then I think that he would probably recognize that it's better for him to step aside now than try to lead France to 2022 success. Uh, you know, because obviously now for France to hold both the world and European titles, they, he's going to have to wait, uh, you know, a, a yeah. pretty long time. And I don't, I don't see him seeing out another two international tournaments with France. You could make a case for 2022 still, but I think this has been a major setback. I think it made more sense to keep Deschamps on if France won Euro 2020. And now that we know that they've gone out, uh, you know, I don't think that it would be, 
that's silly a decision from the FFF, uh, you know, to, to make a play for Zidane, especially as he is available right now. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, you know, just uh, hit, hit it while it's hot I mean, and he's got, he's got no job right now and I'm, and it's one of his wishes. So we'll see what happens. But anyway, congratulations to Switzerland who will now face Spain. Let's quickly talk about that game because that was fun too. <laughs> Spain against Croatia. It, unbelievable. Uh, you know, obviously we can go through it back and forth, but the main component, at least from the 90 minutes, was how Croatia equalized uh, in the dying seconds of that game, making it 3-0. You know, it began with a, you know, Unai Simon uh, calamity uh, of an own goal, but he did redeem himself at the beginning of stoppage time when it looked like Croatia was set to score a goal and they didn't. And then in the end, Spain victorious, uh, unbelievable. Another amazing game, Jonathan Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things as well that I found, you know, most incredible was that it, they both pretty much followed the same, uh, you know, plot. Well, basically up until the end of the 90 minutes, because you have one team going ahead 1-0, the other then going 3-1 up, and then the other team pulling back to 3-3 before the end of 90 minutes. Uh, you know, it's fantastic entertainment, especially if you're a neutral, uh, you know, and you're not sort of invested in it emotionally, uh, you know, but also when, when you are rooting for one of those teams, especially if they come out on top, it's, you know, it's a pretty great feeling to, to see your team be able to perform to that level. Uh, you know, and I think... You know, Spain deserved it overall. Uh, you know, I'm delighted for Pablo Sarabia as somebody that you know, I see week in, week out at PSG to, to, to have that sort of success on the international stage. I mean, own goals have just been a recurring theme throughout the whole tournament. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious we're probably going to hit double figures for them. I think we're on nine already. Uh, you know, now we just need one more to hit, to get to 10. Uh, and, you know... <laughs> The, the Croats as well, you know, to, to, to be able to pull that off with, with two quick fire goals so late in the game, uh, you know, like the Swiss, it was just, it, it, it was incredible. But instead of, you know, the, the, you know, the Swiss being able to see it out to penalties and then win on spot kicks, you know, the, the Croats, they kind of felt spent uh, at the end of that 3-3. That three, three. Uh, you know, you, were, you kind of felt like it, all it would take would be Spain to get the one goal and then they would collapse. And that's, you know, that's how it turned out with those two quick fire goals for the Spanish. So I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see Luis Enrique's men advancing, you know, considering that they found their scoring touch now, but they were very difficult to watch at the beginning of the tournament. And I don't think that's necessarily down to, uh, you know, coaching pragmatism like France, like England. Uh, you know, I think that's just because that there wasn't really, uh, you know, that much of a, a, a plan for the Spanish. It was sort of stick with the tactic of old, you know, pass the, the opponent to death and it doesn't necessarily work anymore. And I think, you know, these last couple of matches in the year have really shown Spain now that they need to just wake up, go at it with the attacking tools that they have, uh, you know, and they could still go far. And I think they will be breathing a huge sigh of relief, uh, you know, having seen France uh, fall here because that, now that makes a deep run, uh, you know, a very real possibility for them. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And listen, sometimes the answer is simpler than we think. To your point, Spain just sticks with the same program, but I think they were just faster now, right? They're just, they're creating, their decision making is faster in the final third. You know, Morata's a little bit more mobile. You know, Jordi Alba is pushing, uh, you know, uh, the midfield to go with him, but also the, the return of Sergio Busquets has helped tremendously to get, to get that covered to uh, man of the match performances, of course. But you know, it's the same old system for Luis Enrique. And like he always says, and I've said this before, like a bottle of champagne, Spain is once it pops, you know, everything uh, <laughs> flows into rhythm. It's going to be. You, you, you've been listening to too much Luis Enrique. I love Luis Enrique. <laughs> I like, you know, uh, he, he's, he's, he's so interesting to me. It was very funny ahead of that game against Croatia when the reporter asked him, are you going to change your formation? And he was like, maybe. Or maybe, and then the reporter was like, no. And he's like, bravo, <laughs> just teasing everybody. I love it. I mean, uh, to, be honest, to be honest, I think there's more of a chance of him changing his outfit than changing formation. <laughs> 100%, 100%. But I'm, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you brought up Busquets because, you know, the one thing that I do really feel in both of the games today is that we saw the outstanding performance from the middle of the pitch. I think Busquets yeah. was phenomenal for Spain. And I think it's a real shame for the tournament that Pogba's uh, going home with France because although the French have been underwhelming at times, I think that Pogba's had a fantastic tournament. And he, for me, has really 
he's seen his stock rise even higher. I mean, you know, we saw him already being a key component for the 2018 World Cup success, and he's just grown and matured even more. You know, you've now got Manchester United fans hoping that he's going to stick around uh, for longer because they can see, you know, just how much quality he has when he's played in a system uh, you know, that plays to his strengths and he's paired with somebody that he has a real understanding with. Uh, you know, I think regardless of, of whether it's Deschamps or Zidane, uh, you know, who's coaching France at the 2022 World Cup, France really need to do whatever they can to keep Pogba, uh, you know, at this uh, moment in his international career, because the the form that he's producing uh, for Les Bleus every time he takes to the pitch with them is is sensational. Yep, one of the most uh, impressive performances I've seen uh, with Paul Pogba and France, uh, definitely even in that loss to Switzerland. All right, well, that you have it. Uh, Spain against Switzerland. If you had that at the very beginning of the tournament, well, please give me a call. Probably a rich man right now. Yeah, I would love to know some lottery numbers from you, please. (laughs) That's unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to preview Tuesday's action, which includes... England against Germany. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to Kigo Lasso Euro 2020. We are talking Tuesday's action. England against Germany, Jonathan Johnson. Before we discuss, I just want to mention a few betting tips here from our own Lee Phelps. Um, he has England winning and under two and a half goals. That's over 350 plus 350 in William Hill. That's a pretty good bet. He doesn't have it. He's just giving you some choices here. Kai Havertz over two shots plus 125 and Kai Havertz to be carded plus 350. That's a, that's some interesting ones. Uh, we'll be talking about the Sweden Ukraine game in a second, but the England win and under two and a half goals is an intriguing one. England haven't conceded a goal yet remember everybody, but Germany are uh, looking a little bit more adventurous going forward. All right, Jonathan Johnson, England against Germany, the rivalry for some, especially the Germans, it might be a different type of idea of what a rivalry means, but we obviously know, you know, England haven't beaten Germany in a major competition since, of course, the World Cup in 1966, the losses to Euro 96 as well. They have that 5-1 win in the World Cup qualifier in 2001. You know, there's there's history obviously everywhere, but the Germans obviously definitely in the modern game have been way more successful. How do you see this one, England against Germany? Well, you know, I really, really hope uh, that we're not looking at under two and a half goals because I think we've all been <laughs> spoiled so much today. <laughs> the, 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 next, the next game that doesn't deliver sort of more than like five or six goals is going to be seen in a, as a major disappointment, which is kind of why I'm a bit worried about the, the final matchup tomorrow between Sweden and Ukraine. But who knows? I mean, yeah. th- this tournament's showing itself to be so unpredictable now that really anything can happen. Uh, you know, England really could come out of their shell, uh, you know, and show their true attacking potential. But also at the same time, Germany now have nothing to lose because uh, I remember saying this when we previewed the tournament, that if they were to somehow get out of the group stage, that's already a success for them. And to be honest, they've somehow managed to do that despite being a bit of a car crash on the pitch. You know, they had that win over Portugal, which, you know, at the time kind of sent a, a few ripples through the tournament. Uh, and then obviously we've seen Portugal underwhelm, uh, you know, since and go home. So, you know, I really, it's, it, it's going to be a fascinating one for me. Uh, if I had to have picked a game before all of these kicked off that would go to extra time and penalties, I actually probably would have said England and Germany. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see it go beyond 90. But I just think that there's, you know, there's so much at stake on, on both sides. Uh, you know, I think obviously... Uh, it, it's a, it's a major occasion uh, for England. It's a massive opportunity as well for them. And I, you know, I also think it's kind of a, like a final chance for Southgate because I think if England are to fall flat here and go out to Germany, I'm not sure that he'll survive it. You know, I think that he will be one of the the managerial casualties. It feels like England have almost gone as far as they can under him. I'm not convinced that England will go on and win the tournament. I know that some people are, uh, you know, but I do think that they definitely have enough. Uh, in the squad to to get past Germany, so you know I'm I'm tempted to say that you know I England will win this comfortably, 
but I think there's so much history attached to it. The players know the importance of it, the fans as well. Uh, and for me, uh, I think that they're probably still going to overfocus on that. So like I said earlier, it really wouldn't surprise me to see this go beyond 90. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that Germany might be party poopers. But uh, like I said, if England can unlock that attacking potential, and I, I really hope, uh, you know, trying to put my Aston Villa bias aside, that Jack <laughs> Grealish plays a significant role in that, uh, you know, then, then I think anything is possible. Anything is possible. Listen, just a few things. Uh, just a quick correction, everybody. Uh, England haven't been in Germany in the knockout stages of a major tournament since the World Cup in 66. Uh, but regardless, a few things from what you said. I mean, listen, here's the problem. Gareth Southgate wants everybody to forget about the history. And to your point, sometimes you just, you can't. Definitely from an England side. Germany, I'm not so sure. But English fans and the team itself, they know that England, Germany means a lot, right? So that's already in it. The other part of it, which is something that we discuss a lot here with our friend Jimmy as well, is that England are one of these teams that Gareth Southgate still doesn't know his best 11. He still doesn't understand, like, he still is trying to figure it out. And, and if, again, if you don't by this point know that a player like Bukayo Saka or Jack Grealish really should be playing and you can try and fit it within a system that can help them then I don't know what to tell you because Germany is going to come here and they're going to punish me. You know, the, defensively, they're vulnerable, okay? And, you know, the depth of England, I think, will help them, especially I think substitutions will be a key thing in this game. The further the game goes along and the further, it, like you, you say, it goes to extra time. Somebody like Marcus Rashford comes in late, you know, he's fresh, he feels good. You know, he can probably be a problem against Germany. And when they play this 3-4-2-1 system as well, it's something that worries me. I still don't trust the fact that Kimmich is not really playing in the middle, like it's more on the right. You know, that that kind of worries me a little bit. I, I, I'm i agreeing. I don't want it to be a boring one nothing, but I feel like it's going to be. I, 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 I'm, te I'm tempted to go with England for all the points that you just said. I But... Being a party pooper from a German perspective is not th something that would surprise me uh, at all, at all. Well, one, other, one other thing that we haven't discussed is the fact that England are pretty much the only team who are still going to be able to call on home advantage. You know, I think that, that is a massive boost that, that nobody else can call upon. We've already seen what happens to the likes of the Netherlands when you take that away. Uh, you know, and I think that, that, I mean, Italy as well, Italy struggled up against Austria until they finally managed to make the breakthrough through that fantastic Chiesa goal. So, you know, I think that home advantage, England really need to make it count because if they don't, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll be kicking themselves because, you know, you're looking at some of the big names that are falling out of this tournament and it's, uh, you know, it's a massive opportunity for them. I mean, okay, it's a bit too early to, to, to sort of be thinking about potentially winning it. I, you know, I know that Phil Foden's already talked about it and the possibility of dyeing their hair blonde if they, they manage to go all the way. You know, put that out of your minds. And if you're just sort of concentrating on reaching the next round, you know, England do have a, have a good chance. It's, uh, you know, it's just about whether, you know, I think Southgate as well should look at what's happened, uh, you know, with the likes of Deschamps, you know, because he's pretty much mirroring Deschamps' approach to the 2018 World Cup, very yeah. pragmatic, sort of what, hoping that his team grows into it. And then Deschamps tries to make uh, an inexplicable change in the formation against Switzerland and gets punished for it. You know, so if Southgate sticks to what he knows, uh, you know, which is pretty much the only thing that, that Joachim Löw can really be praised for at this moment in time, then, you know, I think that, that, you know, they have a better chance of winning. I don't think it'll necessarily be pretty, uh, you know, but I think that might be the most uh, effective way to do it here. Yeah, you made a very good point about Wembley. Um, I think England still haven't used Wembley to their advantage yet. I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that over. And I feel like this could be the game where they do that. The other thing that I'm intrigued to is uh, as we think about formations, uh, I wonder if Gareth Southgate will try and mirror what Germany does with a three at the back and they just pushes with the wing backs or, you know, Harry Maguire should obviously start but then you think about and the Kyle Walker and Luke Shaw situation how wide can they go and then the final thing is obviously as you all should know that by Monday night Mason Mount and, and Chilwell's isolation uh, restrictions are over uh, and, and they should be uh, available for this game you know obviously Chilwell I'm not sure but Mason Mount is a major part of this uh, so that has to be spoken for as well all right so Okay, well then let's do it. Then give me a prediction here. What, what do you think? Your score prediction. Go ahead. 
I'm going to say it goes to extra time and Germany win 2-1 <laughs> in extra time. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, and you know what? While, while 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 we're still on that point, you know why England have never tapped into Wembley's uh, potential? Why is that? It's a crap is a crap stadium. Yeah, so it's 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 a controversial opinion. Uh, having been there, and it's not just the fact that I was there when Villa lost. It's just a bad experience <laughs> as a fan. You feel, what? The, the, is it is it the uh, acoustics or is it you know that's it's the- it's, it, it, it's a bit of everything. It's uh, I mean I just I feel you've been to the old Wembley, right? You've been old. To, you went to the old Wembley Stadium. Yeah, and it's, it's would, nothing compared to that. I mean, nothing, I think the thing that nothing, I hate the yeah. most about Wembley is the VIP area. Right, and I think right. that's that's the grudge that most people hold against it, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Because the old Wembley, I've been there many times, and that gave you real feels. And I feel that the new one, obviously, doesn't give you that. But a very good point. But we will see what happens. I'm going to go with an England win. I can't say, I can't agree with you, JJ, <laughs> and give a Germany win. And then we end this podcast like this. It's ridiculous. So um, I will give an England win, but it's not going to be an exciting game. It's not going to be a Tuesday situation. I'll do one nothing England. Um, and, and there you have it, because there's no other way. There's no way that I see a goal first. That, that's for damn sure. All right. Well, let's talk about Sweden against Ukraine, which, you know, on the face of it, it could be the least interesting one, but you never know. I mean, Ukraine, you know, they nearly, you know, tied against the Netherlands. They got some goals in them. Uh, Yarmolenko is doing his thing, uh, led, of course, by Andrei Shevchenko. And Sweden, on their own hand, have been really riding their own luck and been taking advantage of a lot of situations. Emil Forsberg, a good player, controlling uh, the midfield. What, what, how do you see this one? You know what? I see this one actually taking people by surprise and being quite entertaining. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can't say that it's going to top uh, Spain, Croatia or France, Switzerland. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we live in hope. But uh, no, I think I, th- I think this one for me, I can't, I, to be honest, it really wouldn't surprise me if Ukraine managed to, to get it done uh, sort of by one goal. I, I definitely see both teams scoring. Uh, you know, I hope for Alexander Izak that he manages to get himself on target because he's done really well this tournament. I feel he's one of those players, uh, you know, who's really raised his, uh, his, his profile, certainly at an international level. Uh, and, you know, I think that for all the, you know, the, the, the industry that he's shown, he definitely deserves something uh, at the end of it. But also Ukraine as well. I've, you know, I've seen this team progressing over the last couple of months. I saw them up close when they came to Paris in a World Cup qualifier. And I, all, I really thought then that they'd be tough to beat uh, this summer. And it's kind of proved uh, to, to be the case. Uh, you know, and they have that ability to just score these stunning goals out of nowhere, seemingly. Yeah. So for me, I can see this going similar way to Sweden, Poland in the group stage, but with Ukraine coming out on top instead of Sweden. So I'm going to say, I, I'm going to be very optimistic and say 3-2. 3-2. Well, well, hopefully we get a good game like that. By the way, just some notes from Lee Phelps here. Uh, he, you know, if you are... Looking at this game, Sweden to win and both teams to score. That's plus 400. It's not bad. And uh, for Forsberg to score, Sweden to win and both teams to score. That's 1,100. That's pretty good. That's some good stuff there from Lee Phelps. Ukraine are a very inconsistent, or inconsistent is probably another word. I don't know. Unpredictable team. You know, they, they, they score. They sc- yeah, I like that. There you go. There you go. They score four goals. They conceded five. So it's, you know, it's, it's, they'll give you some, but they also allow you to play as well. And Sweden, I feel a bit, they're a bit more uh, contained, collectively organized, but I'm with you. I think this is a game where we, we will see goals. I don't know if it'll be three, two, but we will see goals. I have Sweden winning this one, riding their luck, taking advantage of the fact that they've already, experience similar opponents in their group and they'll go through, but I wouldn't be surprised if it goes the other way. And I wouldn't be surprised if this goes into extra time. So, you know, you said Ukraine, right? Or did you say Sweden too? Yeah, no, I said Ukraine. Oh, well, there you go. Andrei Shevchenko's uh, team. And then, and then, and then that'll re that'll reignite where well, if it is Sweden, it'll reignite the old England Sweden rivalry from the early two thousands. That's right. <laughs> and everybody remembers that Zlatan Ibrahimovic call uh, against England as well. That was pretty special as well. But so much to look forward to. There's no way, Jonathan Johnson, that what Tuesday's action will copy Monday. Is there? Do you think? No chance. 14 goals on Monday, Jonathan Johnson. 
Yeah, uh, it's stunning. I'm, I'm really not sure we're going to see anything that will rival this for the remainder of the knockout phase. But then again, we keep saying this kind of thing. You know, we, we said that we didn't think that we'd see some of the drama that was produced on the final match days uh, in the group, uh, again, in the knockout phase. And then we've had a day like this, which, you know, has just blown all of our expectations away. I mean, I think this day has set the bar particularly high, uh, you know, but I, I I do think that we will still see you know, probably some, some more very entertaining ties uh, in the quarterfinals. I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, these final set of round of 16 games will be the pick uh, of the round, uh, you know, but I'm definitely expecting uh, good things from the, the quarterfinals looking at the way that it's shaping up at the moment. Absolutely. What a day. And uh, can't wait to have more of this. And Jonathan Johnson, make sure that you uh, read all his content on cbsports.com as well as follow him on Twitter, John underscore Lee Gossip. JJ, final thoughts before we say goodbye, my friend. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, disappointed that France haven't managed to go all the way. But considering the way that the tournament's gone since the start, uh, it, it's not been a major surprise. I mean, things started to go awry a little bit in Hungary, uh, you know, and then they struggled against Portugal as well. Uh, you know, I'm glad that there was some entertaining football along the way, some great stories, you know, Hungary going so close to a shock win and then ultimately falling short. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, France have been unable to get that European crown to go with the, the, the world title. Uh, and now I think it's time that they really make some serious decisions uh, about the future, because obviously, uh, you know, sticking with the status quo uh, on the evidence of this tournament is, uh, is not the way forward. And if this happens to be Didier Deschamps' final uh uh, you know, last dance uh, as France coach, then, you know, he's done a fantastic service to his country, but it seems like France already have their success awaiting in the wings uh, if the French Football Federation decide to, to make that change now. Yeah, you heard it here first. I feel Zinedine Zidane is going to manage France by the end of the year. We will we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, that would be amazing. Jonathan Johnson, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much, man. Likewise. Thanks a lot for having me on. Pleasure to be with you and looking forward to the next one. Everybody, I want to thank Jonathan Johnson for joining me today. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Kegolasso Pod. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Kegolasso, and of course, CBS Sports and your CBS Sports app. We have plenty more coverage. Make sure that you stay with us throughout the tournament and beyond. Have a great, great day. 